I think in 2007, uh, globalization uh, as a mode of organizing the world has been discredited. The multilateral system is in crisis. The International Monetary Fund, uh, partly because of its role in the Asian financial crisis, is at the moment fighting for relevance, fighting for survival. The World Bank is also experiencing a crisis of legitimacy and hopefully it will translate into a budget crisis as more and more governments uh, refuse to borrow from it and from the IMF. And of course, the World Trade Organization, you know, that was supposed to be the crown jewel uh, of multilateralism, uh, is stalemated in Geneva. And hopefully, this organization will also unravel. Of global warming, peak oil, and natural resource depletion is in fact part of a bigger crisis. And that is the crisis of capitalism. Now, how are we in the North and the South going to collectively confront this crisis? And I would just like to put forward several considerations um, fairly quickly. Uh, first of all, the ecological crisis is of such dimension that whatever adjustment takes place should be a global adjustment both on the part of the North and on the part of the South. The second is that the burden of adjustment, however, must fall largely on the North, which is mainly responsible for the massive consumption that is creating climate change and related environmental problems. We are talking about radical cutbacks in consumption of goods and services in the North. We are talking about very little economic growth, and we are talking about stopping entertaining ideas that somehow we can decouple economic growth from energy use. At the global level, those that consume the most, the North, must also have the larger part of the burden, and at the national level, our upper classes must have a substantial part of the burden as opposed to the masses of people. Ecologically sensitive adjustment in the South will not take place unless the South gives up the high growth development strategies that the World Bank and Orthodox economists continue to prescribe. Eight to 10% growth rates are ecologically criminal. And yet, the World Bank still thinks this is uh, ideal. Now, the only rationale for an 8% growth rate is for the elite to appropriate 6% of this growth and allow the other 2% to trickle down to the masses. So this is really the rationale for this so-called high-speed growth that they continue to prescribe in the South. I would in fact even say that the center of gravity of the environmental movement has moved from the North to the South. Farming communities, environmentalists, indigenous communities, all coming together to be able to resist this kind of export-oriented industrialization that has been pushed by global capital. The most interesting and very hopeful area where we see the growth of a major environmental movement has been in China. Again, it might be spontaneous at this point, but the environmental movement in China is one of the big news items of the last several years. Environmental-related protests, riots, and disputes increased by 30% in 2005 to more than 50,000 incidents. Let me also cite, for instance, the case of Thailand. Export-oriented growth, globalization has been discredited in Thailand, and what do we see at this point is there is a paradigm that is sweeping the country that is called the sufficiency economy. And the sufficiency economy is a paradigm of low growth, self-reliance, ecological sensitivity that is put forward no less than by the king himself. So there is this strong receptivity in the South to alternative modes of growth, and that the South is itself at this point generating the route to 
alternatives to corporate-driven, ecologically destructive globalization. It is not the people in the South that are the problem. It is the national elites that spout the ultra third world this line that the South has yet to fulfill its quota of polluting the world, which the North has already, while the North has already exceeded its quota. It is this elites who call for an exemption of the rapidly industrializing countries from mandatory limits on greenhouse gas emissions under a new Kyoto Protocol. When the Bush administration says it will not respect Kyoto because it does not bind China and India, and China and Indian governments say they will not tolerate curbs on their greenhouse gas emissions because the U.S. has not ratified Kyoto, they are in fact playing out an unholy alliance to allow their economic elites, U.S., Indian, Chinese, to continue to evade their environmental responsibilities and free ride on the rest of us. Let me just say that as a person from the South, I can say together with others that when it comes to environmental issues, our governments do not speak for us. Civil society in the South must act and is acting independently of governments, many of which are bankrupt and corrupt. Global capitalism in its dynamics uh, is the main culprit of the social environmental mess that we find ourselves in at this point. Corporations are the embodiment or the expressions of capitalism. But capitalism is more than just corporations. Capitalism is a social relation that gets reproduced and reproduced. And the agencies of capitalism are corporations and other entities. The central dynamic of capitalism is the transformation of living nature into dead commodities through the mediation of human labor. Capitalism runs on the profit principle, which means that it must continually create needs for commodities, which is the source of profitability. Capitalism is ever-increasing consumption, which is a why it has, in this era of ecological limits, become an obsolete mode of production. David Harvey says that um, corporate capitalism has entered a period of what he calls accumulation by dispossession. This means that uh, we are seeing a period of rapid corporate control of the different elements and dimensions of the global commons. We're talking about knowledge, which is being expropriated to traditional, uh, to trade-related intellectual property rights, land, natural resources, public enterprises, public goods. And capitalism is moving into this phase of accumulation by dispossession because it is seeking desperately to address the crisis of profitability that has gripped it since the 1970s. The need um, of restraining growth and decreased competition that is the demand or the great need during this period of a worsening environmental crisis runs up against the logic of accumulation by dispossession. And I would say that today, indeed, never has capitalism stood more in contradiction to nature and the environment than in this period of global warming, of period of accumulation by dispossession. Being that the solution ultimately must be something much broader. When we try to understand our current mode of production, that this is only about really 300 years old, and that the emergence of the current system of capitalism, in fact, involved the disembedding of the market and the economy from the social matrix in which it was embedded, 
which was guided by other values, and those were the values of community, solidarity, and justice. And that we are indeed, with this current mode of production, in fact, in an abnormal state. And that what we need to do, and the great challenge before us, is in fact to say that this, this embedded market represented by corporations is an abnormal state and the challenge is to re-embed our economic system, the market, into the social matrix of society guided by values of solidarity, of community, and of justice.